Look at this satellite image. It's a rather unassuming looking industrial site. It might even seem a bit abandoned. It's not looking the best maintained with all these rusty structures. However, it is not rust caused by neglect. It's actually the corroding aftermath of one massive explosion, registering 2.4 on the Richter scale and being felt over 28 miles away. Amazingly, though, when looking at these pictures, no one was killed here. But what is this place? Well, it is the subject of our video today. It is the Buntsfield Oil Storage Facility. My name is John and welcome to Plainly Difficult. This video wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my Patreon, YouTube and Ko-fi members. If you'd like to support the channel financially, then you can from just £1 per month. And as always, the links will be in the pinned comment below. Buntsfield. This is the Buntsfield Oil Depot. It's around here on my map, just outside the frequently cited most beautiful town in England. It's in the county of Hertfordshire, if you wanted to know that, although you probably didn't. The site for the Buntsfield Oil Depot opened for use in 1968. It became over the years a vital cog in the British fuel industry, reaching the fifth largest oil depot in the UK having pipelines radiating out from it across the country. The site has three main areas of operation under their own companies. One is the Hertfordshire Oil Storage Limited, a joint venture between Total UK Limited and Chevron Limited, and it was under the day-to-day -day management of Total UK. Another site is owned by British Pipeline Agency Limited, a joint venture between BP Oil and Shell Oil UK. Both assets were owned by UK Oil Pipelines Limited. And finally, another site to the south was owned by BP Oil UK. Vast amounts of fuel was pumped and stored on site from dedicated tank farms. The tanks themselves formed the primary containment of hydrocarbons. If there was a leak, then there was a secondary containment in the form of retaining wall buns provided. If all that failed, there was tertiary containment. This was in the form of drainage and catchment areas. The secondary and tertiary forms of containment were focused on limiting environmental contamination. Delivery from the site was mainly done via lorry, of which over 400 per day could be serviced and dispatched out to customers. This supplies petrol and diesel to petrol stations and jet fuel to Heathrow, Gatwick and Luton airports. This equates to roughly 8% of UK oil storage capacity. The split of fuels is roughly half aviation and half everything else, including the petrol and diesel. Needless to say, this means that the site is one massive potential explosion risk. It had a hazards planning consent to store up to 194,000 tonnes of hydrocarbon fuels, although it's rarely at full capacity in day-to-day -day operation. So when the tanks are being filled, you have to make sure you don't overfill it. And that's where our sponsor for today comes in. Sorry, I'm only joking. Anyway, at Buntsfield, this was done via level gauges, which would give operators in the control room an indication of the tank level. There were three alarms that could be given to operators. User high, which could be set by the supervisor to indicate an intervention was required. This was if they wanted to, say, fill up a tank only halfway. High level. This was set in the tank below its maximum working level. And finally, there was a high, high level alarm set below the final safety system's kick-in threshold. Speaking of which, that final safety system, which operators had to their disposal, was an additional independent system. This was an independent high-level switch. When working as intended, it would automatically shut down filling if being overfilled. The system made use of a float to detect the fluid level. Kind of like the float in your toilet system. These are vital components as to not overfill your tank. So much so that the site made sure that every gauge was working to precision, right? The disaster. This is tank 912, and on the evening of the 10th of December 2005, it is about to be filled up with some top tier good ship petroleum. It is equipped with its gauge and independent high level switch, but a tank has been problematic in the past. 
it had been serviced in August the same year, and even though apparently fit for use, its gauge would often freeze and show incorrect readings. So much so, it was common for it to get stuck, that it, operators often ignored this. The tank was set up to receive petrol from the south pipeline. Fuel gushed in, and the level gradually showed rising on the operator's screen. However, at around 3.05 in the morning, on the 11th, of December, the gauge stopped registering an increase in fuel. The filling of petrol continued. Now the gauge had the ability to give an audible warning when the tank was reaching full, and the operators had been trained to react to these audible warnings. However, with the gauge frozen at its level, it didn't give any audible alarms, and thus was not noticed by any of the operators. The fuel kept on filling the tank. Now the independent system, you know like the one that's in your toilet system, unbeknownst to the operators, was also inoperable. Basically, they were filling the tank blind. By 5.37 in the morning, fuel started to overtop and spill out of the tank. Visible white vapour started to rise out, being seen from behind the bund walls. The cloud gradually spread out to a diameter of 360 metres, or 393 yards. The windless morning meant the cloud didn't disperse, but just sat there increasing in density. It eventually rose over tank 12, which had been used for storing kerosene. The cloud was seen by workers on site and by waiting lorry drivers. This was at around 6am, however, and one minute later the first fire alarm would be sent out. The alarm created an audible alert in addition to starting the firefighting water pumps. But in a cruel turn of fate, one of the pumps generated a spark, igniting the now massive fuel air bomb. It was estimated that 250,000 litres of fuel had escaped the tank. The explosion completely flattened the surrounding area, shattering glass for miles around, severely damaging the nearby industrial park and injuring over 40 people. But in a massive turn of luck, no one was killed in the explosion. Which means I can hit this button again. The explosion woke up people across London and registered 2.4 on the Richter scale. Emergency services were called and firefighters would battle the flames for five days. It would be deemed the largest peacetime fire in the UK up until that point in history. The fire was extinguished on the 13th of December 2005, but not for long. In a final gasp of flaming defiance, one storage tank reignited in the evening. The firefighters decided it was easier to just let it burn out than attempting to extinguish it. The disaster would cripple the UK fuel industry, putting greater pressure on the remaining national infrastructure. Panicked motorists began queuing up at petrol stations in the region, causing localised shortages. Long distance flights out of Heathrow had to make additional stops in Europe for refuelling. Six buildings closer to the blast had to be demolished, with a further 30 needing severe repairs. In the following May in 2006, groundwater contamination was detected and this was from water runoff from the firefighting operations. Economically, the explosion was devastating for nearby businesses. An Azos warehouse was damaged, ruining some four to five million pounds worth of stock, killing the company's Christmas ambitions. But on a smaller scale, multiple companies couldn't get access to their premises for quite some time, essentially holding off any profit for them to make. Originally, the site had been built out of town, but as we've seen before over the years, industrial, commercial and residential properties edged in on the site boundaries. Of course, there would be lawsuits, of which there were 2,700 claims, totalling over £1 billion. The High Court would rule that the companies involved in the disaster would be liable for £700 million of this in claims. Five companies would be charged with criminal negligence, brought by longtime friends of the channel, the health and safety executive, as well as the environmental agency. The five companies were found guilty and given fines ranging from £1,000 up to £6.2 million. But what caused the explosion? Well, it was the spark from, ironically, the firefighting water pump. OK, OK, what was the cause of the overflow? Well, that is what the investigation was hoping to answer. The investigation. The incident would be delved into by the health and safety executive who would investigate, dig in to witness statements, as well as look at the vast wreckage of the site after the explosion. 
They found that the two main causes of the overflow were caused by the failure of the gauge and the failure of the independent safety system. Let's look at the latter first. So the system could be installed to detect either a high or low fluid level. The system had a test lever which had three states, up, middle and down. This allowed operators to test the system by moving the lever up to trigger an alarm. If set up for a high level scenario, the floats lever must not go into the low position as this would essentially disable the system. To prevent the lever from going to the lower position, a padlock was provided. This would keep the lever in the middle position during normal operation. However, operators needed to do regular system checks. To do this test, they had to remove the padlock to push the lever into the upward position for testing out the alarm. However, it was found that after a test, the padlock had not been replaced thus allowing the lever to go into the lower position, disabling the automatic shutoff. Operators didn't know about the strange design quirk in this system. So now then, what of the gauge and its freezing during filling? Well, apparently this was a known issue since the tank had been serviced earlier in 2005, but no one thought to chase this up and log the fault. Instead, they relied on the independent system preventing an overfill, which we now know was accidentally disabled but surely someone would have seen the frozen gauge level. Well, operators often had to have multiple windows open on their computer screens during filling due to multiple operations being undertaken at once. This meant that the operators would have to make a conscious decision to flick through to the active window to see the filling levels. Obviously, this would mean that some fillings would not be fully monitored. In addition, there were multiple management issues of not enforcing safety checks and trying to increase throughput of fuel. Reportedly, operators didn't have control over fuel flow rates either, which caused filling issues. Thus, the stage was set very well for a disaster. As for the groundwater contamination, it was found that the bun retaining walls had cracked during the fire and subsequent pressure from the water and fuel. This had allowed contamination to get into the ground. On the whole, the Bunsfield disaster was just another balls up of engineering, staff and management issues. So that's my video on the Bunsfield disaster. It's going to be a 2 on my scale, and this is what I've got for my root cause analysis card. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below. This is a Plain Difficult production. All videos in the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plain Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in a very wet and windy corner of South London, UK. And all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching, and Mr Music, can you play us out please?